I'll call it. Cheers. Now, this next film is one that many of you will identify with, because sadly, 900,000 people, incredible number of people in the UK, are living with dementia. Yeah, our very own Sean Welby is one of those whose life has been affected by the condition after her father was diagnosed with vascular dementia. Here, she shares her family's story. I think what's changed my dad the most is just his independence. He was such a practical, can-do-it man. I never went to an MOT thinking the car would fail because my dad would fix it. He could do plumbing, he could build shelves. And we started noticing that he he started struggling with the problem-solving element of things like that he'd normally just be able to solve. And so he relies on everybody a lot more. And in that way, not only did he lose his independence, but he started to lose his purpose and, he, and it definitely got him down. Oh, and happy birthday. Is it my birthday? It is. 84 you are today, can you believe it? Good God. <laughs> Before my dad got diagnosed with Alzheimer's, I didn't have a clue about it. I knew it's a very cruel disease and it's something that, as a family, we've never had to deal with. My, my gran never had it, um, my granddad didn't. So it was totally new to me and we, we honestly didn't know anything. My dad is such a character, like the fact that my mum let him have his drum kit in the living room for all of my life. He's always been just a really fun person to be around. We're going to rock around the clock tonight. What is that? And he's quite a quirky character. He used to have this E-type Jaguar that he always talks about, that he spray-painted bright pink. So I think that's where I get all my craziness from, is, is my dad. Who were Tennessee Stud? Yes, they were a band I, play, I played with those. I don't know. Yeah, well. look, Ian Welby, yeah. drums. Yeah. Look, you've written on this one. Oh, yeah, to Helen with love. Oh, I bought it for Helen. Yeah. Your mum. About three years ago, it started. I started getting a little bit annoyed with him, which was most unusual. You know, he'd ask me something and I'd tell him, and then a few minutes later, he'd be asking me the same thing. And I thought, oh, you know, just think about it for a moment. It does creep up on you. He was wandering off to the shed and forgetting why he was going there, but then it started happening more and to the point where he had no memory of why he was going there. Follow me, Dad. OK. The hardest thing is not having that clever man all the time. Sometimes he's there and sometimes he isn't. And the hardest thing is me adjusting to how much help he needs. Sometimes I overstep my mark and I'm helping him too much because he's an independent guy. Mm. And then other times I realised I've asked him to do something that I think is easy, like make a sandwich, and he can't, that day you can't sequence it. There's a lot of advice out there, but it doesn't always appeal to everyone. My dad, for instance, is such a practical man, he would not sit and do a painting or pottery or a jigsaw puzzle. It's just not him, you know. There you go, you can use that one if you want. Do you know what it was? He, he needed to feel like a dad again. He'd, he'd sort of at one point lost his role as a dad because we were doing everything. You know, he couldn't drive, he couldn't make dinner, he couldn't do the shopping anymore. Couldn't cut the grass. Couldn't cut the grass, couldn't fix the cars, couldn't do any of the stuff he'd always did. Do you remember when I brought that whole cupboard up from London just yeah, so he could yeah. paint it with me? Just filming your handiwork. Rather than paint a picture, we would paint a cupboard because that's a practical thing and I said I need it for my house. So I'm literally hauling this cupboard up from London to the Midlands because I knew that this activity was worthwhile doing. I think we bought this down south somewhere. Really? Things like that that then sparked a conversation. He goes, oh, I remember where we got this from. We're on holiday at the seaside. Oh, nice. And then we realised that when his mind was busy doing something practical, the conversation was so much better and he stayed in the moment for so much longer. What do you think the secret is to staying young? Staying young? Yeah. Stay with the young. Stay with the young. And I'd almost describe yeah. it, people say this, of getting your dad back. You know, I got the old dad back when we started doing activities together. And we, we've never really let you retire, have we? Uh, oh, no, I don't think I'll retire. No. No. <laughs> no. I think something will catch up with me for then. <laughs> Obviously, we know that, as, as it stands, there's no cure and it will progressively get worse. I don't know, what are your sort of hopes and fears of the future. I literally just take each day we see him. If we're having a good week, we're having a good week. If we're having a bad week, you just move on and get on with it. And I try not to think too far ahead about where we're going to end up. To dwell on that would just make you sad. So I think it's better just to appreciate what you've got right now and enjoy the right now.
I think the devastating thing about Alzheimer's is it's one of the cruelest diseases because you're losing their personality and eventually you're going to become strangers. Even the thought of it makes me like I could cry now because the thought of someone like your own dad not knowing who you are, the, the thought that it would get to a point where you're going to walk into a room and they'll say, who are you? Do I know you? And it's so possible that it's, it's heartbreaking. Oh, it's very moving, Shan. Uh, Shan joins us now along with neurologist Dr. Catherine Mummery from the UCL Dementia Centre. Um, I can relate. <sighs> um, we've spoken watch, about this. I, I lost my dad to, to vascular dementia three years ago, and it's it's an incredibly difficult journey, but can be in a weird way very rewarding. Mm. Yeah. When you talk about it like you are. A hundred percent, and I think um, part of what, I'm, what I've tried to embrace is not sort of missing the old version of him, mm. but just trying to embrace this this new version of him, which I have to be a bit more patient with and, and sort of make him feel like he can be my dad and I can ask him the right questions. And he can, if, if you do ask the right questions and you get in that conversation, he can, he can carry on almost like normal. Mm. It's just certain things, you know, will catch him out. If the room is too busy, if there's too many voices, if the question is about too many short short-term memory type things like, oh, where did mum go? He can't answer that. Mm. But if you ask him something that was 50 years ago, he'll talk about it for 20 minutes. <laughs> so it's a, it's a really confusing disease in a way because sometimes you can almost forget he has it and then other times it is so obvious. And you, you've hit on something there because, and I guess everyone has the same experience from our experience, it kind of creeps up on you, Catherine, and their mood changes. They mightn't like going into the shower anymore. They might have little accidents now and again. Inexplainable things. You're like, oh, they're very grumpy today. But that can be the start of it. And you just have to learn and gain knowledge, don't you, and get more patient. Exactly. And I think there are two things. I mean, firstly, thank you so much for sharing that film. There's so much yeah. you can learn from that. And it's so relatable. And also, if you think about it, the number of people on this sofa that have got somebody that was affected by dementia um, are at least three out of four of us. They may even be four. So it's a very common problem. But trying to understand the beginning of it and trying to pick it up is really tricky. What you showed was it doesn't define the person at the beginning. You can still get to the real person and you can still make the most of that time yeah. and learn what they can do well and really play with those things with them as a family. I think that's really important. Again, thanks, Sean, for sharing that video. My oh, just it's, it's lovely to see you in your own surroundings. It's <laughs> oh, a beautiful pleasure. video to, to watch. Um, but what are the early signs that, that we should be looking out for? So I think some of them, Sean demonstrated really well in the video with her dad. We all forget words. We all forget names every now and again and get a bit chaotic about an appointment. But if things happen regularly, so, for example, if somebody starts to forget things more quickly, they're repeating a question, they've forgotten the plot of their favourite TV programme, that sort of thing. If their organisation isn't as good as it used to be, you mentioned about your dad, but somebody that used to book a holiday automatically all of a sudden can't do it anymore, can't write a report at work, that sort of thing. And if they start to have little difficulties with words, those sorts of things, or confusion of time or space, those are the things you should go and see somebody about. What about you when you, you know when you go into a room and you just think, what, what am I doing in here? What have I come in here for? You know, what, what's... I did that this morning. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> but I do it all the, <laughs> do it all the yeah. time. Do you know, I found my dad, when that started happening, he, he, a defence mechanism would kick in yeah. and he'd get annoyed. Yeah. And it was him defending just the confusion yeah. and fear. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I relate to that as well, Craig, because I think there's a lot of pride because you don't want to keep repeating yourself. There's, there's stages where my dad is aware that he might have repeated himself or he's aware that his question might sound ridiculous, so he doesn't want to ask. Something that we, that we did, that it took us a while to work out, mm. but he was waking up. If you've only got long-term memory and no short-term, you've got no context, mm. he was waking up not even knowing what year he was in. Mm. So if you have to start the morning with that kind of question, which sounds so mm. bizarre mm. And, it, and it makes you embarrassed, we bought him this clock that said not only the date, the time, but the month, the mm. year, mm -hmm. and gave him that context immediately. Yeah. And it's helped even just my mum not having the same repetitive chat with him, because yeah. he can work some of these things out for himself yeah. now. Yeah. And yeah. often people... Oh, sorry. Sorry, I was just going to say, there, I mean, there is a bit of hope now. There, there is two new drugs on the market. Can yeah. you talk us through them and when they will be looking to be licensed in the UK? Yeah, I mean, we've had nothing, really, in terms of a treatment that can change disease for 20-plus years. But we now have the potential 
to start to change the disease a little bit. And these two new drugs that you're talking about, one's lecanemab, one's donanemab, they are being considered right now for approval in this country. One's approved in the States and China already. What they do, unlike the symptom treatments, is they change the biology in the brain of the disease. So they try and remove the abnormal protein. And that, in the trials, showed a slowdown in the, the progression of symptoms that people had. Not by a huge amount, but by a significant okay. amount. So it's, it's slow in the process. It's slowing it's progression. It's not a cure, but it no, is No, it's slow not a cure. And it's not a, a wonder yeah. drug, but it's okay. the beginning. Yeah. OK, thank you. Uh, right, now here at This Morning, we are pleased to announce that we will be launching a campaign to raise awareness of dementia. Yeah, we want to continue the conversation. It's so important, so we'd like to welcome the Health Secretary, Victoria Aikens, to join us. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, Good morning. And I saw you on the side there listening in very yeah. intently. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, everyone's trying to do something about this. Yeah. There's a lot of unknowns. Uh, I'm glad to say there is funding going towards research. So where are you with that? Well, um, first of all, can I thank you both for sharing your stories? I cannot tell you how much it helps people watching, watching at home who are probably caring for someone mm. as they're watching the television and you sharing your stories and also showing the joy that we can still have with our family members, even when they have this very, very difficult diagnosis. So thank you. And thank you also for your campaign. Um, so in terms of uh, the medical side of this, obviously, Catherine, is the expert, but uh, in 2013, David Cameron challenged all of the uh, G7 nations, the, the biggest economies in the world, to find uh, treatments for dementia and Alzheimer. Uh, and that is why these two medicines that are emerging, they're being scrutinised at the moment, this is really exciting because that is a worldwide piece of work that we wanted to spearhead because, as you rightly say, Craig, there are 900,000 people living with this at the moment. But as we've discovered um, this morning of course it's not just the diagnosis for Ian or for, for your dad it's the wider ramifications for the family and carers and I have an amazing uh, constituent lady called Chris whose uh, husband Bob very sadly um, was diagnosed with early onset uh, dementia and uh, has passed away but Chris has created uh, a one-stop shop called Bob's Brainwaves which is uh, aimed to help um, people families in the f in the aftermath of that diagnosis, trying to find, you know, the official information they need on with the DVLA, with um, benefits, with um, carers, respite and so on. And, and it's a really successful little programme in my constituency in Lincolnshire. I want, as Health Secretary, to roll that out because I want to help support families and carers in those very difficult days and weeks after a diagnosis where it can all seem very daunting. On a very practical level, and it's brilliant, there's money going yeah. towards research, but... Shan's father living with us and things change all the time. The baseline changes. I know my father, we had to get care in, we had yeah. to get him in somewhere and it's hugely expensive. Yeah. The Irish government have a system called Fair Deal. It looks at the, yeah. the house your parents own, takes a small percentage of that, but it pays a huge chunk. Yeah. About 90% of home care or nursing care needs and that allows you to make really good choices for the person in your life and put them somewhere really nice. Does that exist here and should it exist here? Um, so we, uh, we have a, a system of support and, and we're very, very conscious of the enormously important role that we're, unpaid care is. We're talking about thousands with, of pounds a month. Uh, we are. And, um, and so uh, we announced a little while ago um, uh, reforms that uh, we're looking at uh, introducing October 2025. We're, we're having to work out how we roll that out because this is a, a huge issue for so many people. We're very conscious of that. But as I say, uh, first of all, we want to help with the treatments, but I also want to try and help it with those practical measures in the very first weeks because you will, as a family, have so much on your plate that if we can get this information to you in a one-stop shop, mm. then I really do think that will help a lot of people. And the, the years future. of care. Absolutely. Yes. Years it, it, of care. And, and this is... You, you've, so, you've both explained so well how um, symptoms change, how... Uh, people's reactions change and actually there was an announcement we made this week which I hope um, people will, will find um, helpful uh, we talked about I don't know if you've heard about Martha's Rule yeah. we announced it yesterday it's a really yeah. important um, initiative uh, and it came about because the very tragic case of uh, Martha Mills a, a 13 year old uh, beloved daughter of Meropi and Paul who passed away uh, with sepsis uh, and both Meropi and, and Paul felt that their voices weren't heard in the hospital when they were explaining um, 
uh, the symptoms were changing. And so we're introducing this rule that will um, require or enable parents and families to get a second set of eyes on their loved one if they think their conditions are deteriorating. And that's really important, actually, for elderly patients because families will know if the levels of confusion... You, you will know, the, the if you like, the, what, what their normal is. Yeah. And you will be able to say to the clinicians, look, this is not Dad. You know, mm -hmm. this is... He's deteriorating in a way that a clinician may not. So Martha's rule, we tend to, to look at it from a child's perspective, but I also think, I hope, it will really help our older um, uh, relatives and citizens as well. Um, and that is being rolled out over 100 hospitals. Yeah. Now, we, we've already got a stretched NHS. Yeah. Do you think you can do that, as yes. an opinion? Yes, I'm determined to do this. So we would... It, because it's such a big step forward for patient safety, uh, we have to... You know, we, we can't click our fingers and it happens overnight. So we're rolling out the first tranche of 100 hospitals across England. I, I'm only responsible for healthcare in England. Right. But... Um, uh, and then we will... It will go to every uh, acute hospital. I'm determined to Doctor, do this. Dr Murmury, you're on the front line. Do yeah. you need more funding? We always need more funding. Um, we, uh, for Martha's rule, I think is an absolutely fantastic idea. I agree that the vulnerable, whether they're children or whether they are people that can't actually defend themselves from the point of view of their memory and their function, yeah. so important. From the point of view of, of these new treatments and trying to roll things out in the NHS and making us value for money and available and available to give the treatments in the future, I think that's where the government needs to really look at how we're going to get these treatments out, yeah. how we're going to make sure we give them to people equitably across the country. I completely agree. I'm delighted that Catherine is leading our <laughs> research programme on this. So we've just... We announced a little while ago £50 million more of funding into research because um, we, we all understand we want to stop it and if, uh, if we can't do that, we want to, in the meantime, try and slow it down. It's really exciting that you're leading this. But we... we I mean, the UK is in a unique... Genuinely, we are in a unique position across the world because of our NHS, because of the data that we have, the systems that we have in place, uh, all of the... Life sciences, or if you like, the pharmaceutical mm. companies, yeah. they see us as an amazing place to uh, do their research and to work with us safely to make sure it and gets to patients. Keep having Victoria. the conversations is what yeah. we have to do. Can I just say to yeah. Shan, your family are doing all the right things, yeah. having big Absolutely. conversations yeah. now, Thanks. the difficult conversations yeah. now, and enjoy him. Yeah. Yes. You still your dad. 100%. Play to his Love strength. for you both to come back and do a phone yeah. in with us if you could. That'd love be great. To. Absolutely yeah. love to. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much Thank for coming. You. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you. Okay.